Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the demo day for AI for Impact, the MIT Media Lab course that uh, Sandy Pentland and you started about 20 years ago. For the last two or three semesters, we are start starting a new format, a studio model, where students at Harvard and MIT and Cambridge Ecosystem are creating ventures that can impact a billion lives, but can also be very lucrative. Uh, today, we'll hear the presentations uh, from, for the next 100 minutes or so. Uh, and then we'll have a showcase. Uh, you'll have about 20 teams that you can interact with from 12 to 1. Uh, I'm delighted to have co-instructors and leaders uh, with me in this course. Myself, Ramesh Raskar, uh, professor here at MIT. Uh, Shahid Azim, a serial entrepreneur. Uh, Dave Blunden, uh, leader of uh, Link Ventures. Uh, we have Patricia Gelly uh, from Harvard. Uh, uh, Habib Haddad from E14 Fund. Uh, and John Werner, also from Link Ventures. Um, and we have been delighted with the engagement with so many mentors and speakers who are CEOs, CTOs, you know, very famous VCs, and who are really passionate about how we can use AI and emerging technologies to solve you know, global problems. So we want to thank you all for being part of this amazing, amazing network. Um, and today we are so let's watch a quick video on uh, some of these uh, days that we have seen. Are, I think, still thinking like it's 2022. Uh, and 2022 is, is very far from 2022. We're early days of Web3. The vector society could be decided by venture in this country. So the question there is, how do you make $2 to $3 billion a week for the next 30 years? We can't feel the world which we need to lead every man, woman, and child on the planet. People don't realize how amazing the world is today. MIT fundamentally scours the world. Then they get on campus from a very small subset decide that they want to come to this class. And that's why the density of company creation and of innovation in this room is like no other place on the planet. We're in year 16 or 22, year 22 of Web 2. We're early days of Web 3. The vector is just 1,000x in a decade. Does that even sound like it's in the right ball? <laughs> All right. So what's the difference between you know, what we do here you know, in an academic environment where there's academic research, there's hackathons, you know, there are contests, uh, and then somehow magically, you know, we are supposed to cross this, this huge valley and create startups and incubators and nonprofits and corporate ventures and so on. And we think there are not enough tools uh, here on campus. Uh, and we think it's probably not the, if you want to solve some of the biggest problems, some of the complex problems uh, in energy, in health, in transportation, in redefining our democracy, it's not enough to just say, hey, teams, come and work with us, and we'll guide you and help you write better business plans and you know, improve the fonts in your slide decks. Um, we have to have a completely new model. And, and that's where the studio model comes in, because an innovator may or may not be an entrepreneur on the campus here. The people who have some of the best ideas, some of the best research, may or may not be interested in doing entrepreneurship. And that's where this Venture Studio class comes in, where our goal is to spot you know, really unique problems, um, and we do that for about four weeks and then probe the solutions for additional few weeks. Uh, and just to get into this course, you know, we have you know, more than 100 people who apply. Uh, they have to take you know, a, a, a course, just to get another, take another exam to get in uh, on AI and blockchain and so on. Uh, and then we are down to about 15 teams that will be, be presenting today. Uh, we're also delighted with all the judges. You're sitting here in the front row, you know, some of the top uh, venture capitalists in the country, some of the top CEOs uh, here. Uh, and we really want to thank you uh, for coming here and spending the time with our teams. And they'll be around as well. So we really want to thank you for, 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 for being here. Um, so as, as I said earlier, we want, um, we want to empower teams to have a gigascale impact, a billion people, potentially you know, companies that are worth a billion dollars at the same time. 
Um, and this has been a fantastic journey, you know, uh, the classes, the research, the events, uh, the, the hosting many of you have done all, all across town, uh, and teams are going and winning all kinds of awards. So this is, this is just fantastic uh, what, what they have been doing. Shait? All right, so, uh, so Shawnee and, and Rebecca are here from Team Lumi. They just started last semester, have already started winning awards uh, in women's health. Uh, we have uh, teams looking at, I uh, know, uh, uh, predicting impact of pollution at every location on planet. Uh, we have teams looking at uh, the fan base, you know, millions of fans, in, especially in developing countries, who are not tapped in using AI and Web3. Um, and companies like Vocadian uh, that are really defining uh, ideas around, around digital health. All right. So again, we want to thank you know, everybody who's been here. Uh, Anel, my admin, has been working nonstop, so let's thank her first. Uh, many mentors, investors, speakers, advisors, and the teams themselves. Uh, big thank you to all. Uh, we also want to thank Arbisoft, uh, who's going to provide thousands and thousands of dollars of services uh, to the winning teams. And there are many partners who are providing the services. This is the guidance we have given to the judges. Um, the, 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 the presentations will be judged on only three factors. Impact, is this a gigascale impact? Um, is it unique? Are you, something, do, are you doing another photo sharing app or another marketplace or another you know, hyper-local delivery or something really unique that taps into MIT and Harvard ecosystem? And how complete is your thinking? Uh, we have asked judge not to look at your financial projections or market size, so today's uh, presentations are being judged mainly for the direction, but not necessarily the financial aspect of it. All right, so let's go teams. Uh, every team has three minutes. You'll get, a, you'll get a marker at two minutes. Shahid is right here in front of us, and uh, you'll be cut off at three minutes and additional two minutes for questions. Uh, so we have about 15 teams that are doing amazing work uh, in different spaces. So who's excited about listening to the teams and see where they go? <laughs> And those of you who are here, as well as those of you who are online, go to tiny.cc slash MIT May 11. There's a live WhatsApp group. There's a live Google Doc. So you can enter your comments. You can suggest how you might want to participate uh, in this ecosystem. Maybe even pitch yourself as a co-founder or a you know, first team member for some of these ventures as well. So just follow that along, tiny.cc slash MIT May 11. All right, with that, Let's get the first, first team, Health Galaxy. There are four critical challenges that currently plague the healthcare industry in India. There are more than 600 million smartphone users and no health data on their phones. Almost 90% of patients do not fully understand the implications of their diseases. The healthcare infrastructure is highly constrained with one doctor for 11,500 plus patients and a lot of our healthcare expenditure is spent on reactive care versus preventive care. Meet Raj, a 40-year-old living with his wife, children, parents in a second-tier city in India, probably the sole breadwinner of his family. Given his incredibly stressful lifestyle, Raj would be at a high risk of cardiac diseases, diabetes, etc. Raj is not alone. He represents a hundred plus million households that currently manage their healthcare records with a pile load of documents, all handwritten, almost no health insurance, and rely entirely on their family physician for making these healthcare decisions. Over the next couple of years, things will only get tough with aging parents, dependent children, and a spouse who might not be able to contribute an additional income. Given this, can Raj really afford to fall sick? No. My name is Dhruv Bhatla. My name is Namit Choksi. And, and together, together we're, we're building, building Health, Health Galaxy. Galaxy. Don't go by the complexity of our slides. Dhruv worked at Bain for eight years <laughs> and is currently a first year MBA at Sloan. Namit was a Schwarzman Scholar, Harvard MPH, MIT, and John Hopkins. He has more degrees than a thermometer, but he's finally putting them to good use. <laughs> so how can Health Galaxy help Raj? We are offering a personalized predictive health analytics platform that will empower Raj and his family to fully utilize their health data and ultimately improve outcomes. 
First, Raj will begin by uploading his data across formats on the go. Our app will standardize that data and create simple to understand insights on Raj's heart health. Further, we will incentivize Raj to upload data not currently captured by traditional EHRs. He can then compare these metrics to others in his cohort, and then we in real time will give him recommendations on marketplaces like telehealth, e-pharmacy, spatially track disease trends and for specific targeted interventions from government, and create a personalized community for Raj and his family. Why now? First, because there's increased health adoption of digital health products across the country. Second, the regulatory frameworks and environment is highly, highly favorable. And finally, there's increasing consumer consciousness towards preventive health as evidenced by customer interviews. He has the toolkit. He has the scalpel. And, and you, you have, have the, the money. money. So we hope that you will join us in saving millions of lives in India and across the world. One upload at a time. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, guys, what did we learn in class this semester? 90% of success in life is just showing up. And you guys, didn't, not only did you show up, it was an amazing presentation, but taking the mic first, incredibly gutsy. You could not have kicked us off any better. Thank you for that. Presentation is fantastic. It's a huge amount of information to squeeze into three minutes. I thought you did a very, very good job of getting it whittled down. Uh, I think the minimal MVP isn't as clear as it could be, but I think that's purely because there isn't enough time to really, to really fill it in, but great presentation. Judges, we have one more minute. Questions? So we have uh, time for questions. Guys, how are you going to solve the challenge? Or... Oh, hi. Uh, Susan Garfield, EY. Um, how are you going to solve the problem of getting people to upload that data? The first step, most people don't understand their own medical data. Yeah, so we're doing it two ways. Uh, the first strategy is to work with independent uh, hospitals and NGOs, which don't have the infrastructure but need support externally. We're going to incentivize the doctors. We're thinking of doing revenue share with the doctors to con convert patients to upload the data online. Just to add perspective, you know, the, the doctor-patient relationship in India is very relationship-based versus transactional. So as you can see in, you know, most of our interviews, if a doctor says do it, they'll close their eyes and do it. What's the doctor's involvement in this program? So we, we aim to create a dual interface. Uh, so the patients are going to be the center, but we want to make sure that the doctors have the insights as well so that they can keep track of what's going on with their patients. Uh, because right now, as Namit can attest to it, everybody walks into an appointment with physical records. They have like 100 files, and doctors don't have time to read or sift through that. So they base their judgments on their last report only, and that may not be enough in, in many cases. So really brief, like there's no continuity of care. So a lot of times, you know, we would diagnose a patient as appendicitis when they would be an ectopic pregnancy case and, you know, struggling to survive and just that they didn't have access to the last medical record. So it's going to be more of a, uh, you know, digital health key kind of a thing. Thank you. Thank you. Is next. Audience participation is one, two, three. Everybody right. One, two, three. Good. All right, we'll do it better on the next report. <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Mohit, and I'm a double PhD candidate in statistics and economics here at MIT. And this is Gari, who is a PhD student in computer science at Harvard. Both of us have experience in tech, and fun fact, both of us worked in meta and integrity because we deeply care about user privacy. And that's precisely what we're going to talk, talk about today. We're going to talk about privacy in the context of randomized trials. So I don't need to explain what is a randomized trial. It's a gold standard to evaluate the impact of any new drug, any marketing campaign, et cetera. But there are a bunch of problems associated to randomized trials. For example, it's hard to recruit large, diverse samples. Your users can drop out. It's expensive to collect private information on your users. And you know, clinical trials alone account for a $120 billion market, and $84 billion are spent on market research. That does not count you know, academia or other policy evaluation. Okay. Well, it turns out we can solve all these problems and a few more with our solution, Quart. Now, what is Quart? Quart is a platform for decentralized and anonymous randomized trials where businesses can save costs in terms of privacy compliance, and users can get uh, compensated for not sharing their data. Okay, so think of Web3 meets RCTs. Now, to go over an example of how Quart actually works, let's say we have a client, Starbucks, that wants to evaluate the impact of their new campaign 
bring a mug and get a discount, all right? So they wanna know what's the impact of this campaign on driving foot traffic to their stores. What Starbucks will do here is that there'll be things that Starbucks can see, whoops, things that Starbucks can see and things that Starbucks cannot see. So for example, Starbucks cannot see the user base in court, all right? Now, Starbucks can filter out the kind of users that they wanna have participating in the trial with some demographics like age, location, gender, et cetera. And users that comply with these demographics are invited to participate in the trial, okay? As soon as they, they accept, they get compensated with a few tokens and then some of them will be randomly selected to get the voucher and others will randomly get a placebo. And their phones will start pinging their location in a fully private way without sending any information, not to Starbucks, not to court, all right? As soon as Starbucks decides to end the trial, we're able to aggregate the, these uh, pings, these location pings in a fully anonymous way, okay? So Starbucks will be able to see the number of visits for the treatment group and the control group, and no one ever sent any individual private information, not to Starbucks, not to court. So importantly, there's no one else doing something like this out there. We're not doing federal learning. We're not a web two company with like private like guarantees and we can get the same exact result that you would get if you actually had access to the individual level data. Moving forward, right now we're in a situation where we can run trials that are fully digital, so with digital treatments and digital outcomes, such as the impact of a marketing campaign on user satisfaction. Phase two is something like the Starbucks trial that I just explained, and phase three is a phase with physical treatments and physical outcomes, such as clinical trials, okay? So join us in this journey to make research more private and accessible for companies. You can scan our QR code to stay in touch. We're looking for uh, partners to launch our first large-scale trial. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay. Oh, uh, the question is, can you give us another example of how this could be used? So many people need to write, uh, run trials for many different reasons. It could be you're testing the effectiveness of a new vaccine, you wanna know if your marketing campaign actually increased sales, or like you wanna know if you're driving foot traffic, right? The thing is that whenever you run a trial, you need to collect your outcomes. And when you collect these outcomes, this is expensive. You need to uh, deal with legal compliance, you need to deal with other like um, costs associated to collecting private uh, data. So what we're able to do here is, say you run your campaign, okay? You wanna get the exact causal effect of your campaign on foot traffic, but you don't want your users to freak out saying like, oh, Starbucks is tracking my location, right? Well, we are able to do that in a fully private way. This could be like, I don't know, say you're collecting sensitive information on some disease and you don't want users to feel like, oh, this private information of me is being collected by someone else. For time, we got two other oh, questions. sorry, yeah. Stay yeah. Hi, quick question. So is there a specific vertical that you would want to start with so that you can gain a critical mass and have a trial that has enough participants? Yeah. So first we want to start with something that's fully digital. So for example, say we can start with MIT students, they get um, randomly get a subscription to Headspace. And then we have, uh, say, like uh, a survey that has some indicators of anxiety or depression, for example. And that's something you can do in a fully private way. So people don't have to worry about the fact that people will know if I feel depressed or have symptoms of depression, for example. Okay. How do you make sure you don't have a biased sample in your yeah. user base? So sample selection is always an issue with any sort of randomized trial, okay? The good thing here is that as we can build a user base that can be reused across multiple trials, usually you can do a better selection of the kind of samples that you're targeting at. So if you want a representative sample of the US population with a large enough user base, and the incentives that we provide for registration, for example, with the tokens, you're able to like reduce sample selection biases that are a concern with any sort of random. Is effect. one of your advisors oh. a Nobel laureate? Yes, one of my advisors. Great, where are you stationed here? Later uh, we're right there. We have a working live demo, so you can check it out, see how it works, um, and we can answer more questions. One, two, three. Yes. All right, Thanks. Bound, come on down. Good morning, everyone. Do you need this?
Hi everyone, my name is Heng von Boyon. Um, I'm an actuary by profession and prior to coming to MIT, um, I led a data science team at PwC in South Africa, which was actually tasked with keeping uh, the financial services sector in South Africa safe. It was during this time at PwC where Fount was actually started. Um, a, peer, a problem that we experienced during this time was that in building uh, solutions that can effectively manage and mitigate risk within financial services, you need real-time insights. You need real-time feeds where current static dashboards are just currently not able to produce that. Financial services organizations currently do not have the talent um, available where they can actually blend the unique mix of quantitative finance experience with software engineering expertise to build these solutions. After going on an extensive journey to actually find solutions which we can help our clients with, we came up short. What we ended up doing is we actually ended up building a solution ourselves. Myself and my current co-founder built a uh, integrated risk and actuarial analytics platform which helped financial services organizations to combine those two skill sets to drive real-time insights into what the financial health of their companies actually look like. That is especially relevant currently with the banking turmoil that we currently see within the banking services sector. So the next two years after building the platform, we actually scaled the solution itself in the South African market. We drove it to a, a seven-figure ARR with a team of 10 uh, employees. Very, very efficient. What we are looking to do now is we're looking to move much, much further. We think the ambition of this is absolutely enormous. The applicability of it with the rise and explosion in artificial intelligence that we're currently seeing is enormous to actually take that insight which we produced and just really, really 10 exit. The market that we are looking at is the risk modeling services market, which is where we will initially start. It is an enormous market, really opaque, with a lot of disaggregated data silos, models, et cetera, which we're basically looking to take and bring together to drive this central insight. The current status quo there is really, really outdated, and found as a solution which is looking to take that market and bring it to forward to make our financial services safer. So what does our solution actually look like? Fount is an AI-first model management ecosystem that enables live model query. What that means, it means instead of looking at outdated data which previously had to be run, you can actually directly engage and interact with your models and pull insights from them in real time, which is a departure from the current technologies which a lot of uh, companies are dependent on. The solution is made up of three different layers. Build a layer, which enables you to actually build these models from the ground up. We also integrate with other building solutions that you can build within the solution, the data science solutions that you love. The second is a control layer, which helps us to actual con actually control the com uh, exploding complexity of these models in an AI-first world. And then finally, we've got an insight layer, which sits on top of this, which enables individuals to actually extract the information rather than looking at static dashboards, they can interact with these solutions with the latest craze in natural language. From there on, what we are looking at is the competitive landscape. So we extensively looked at this competitive landscape to see, well, where is it that we really fit in? We know that model development is a really well-solved problem, but the integration between model development and software development is really what we previously solved. What we're looking to do now is really enable intelligent live model query where we see a massive, massive market opportunity. So the builder layer integrates with all of your solutions and wherever it is that you're build, busy building your solution, it brings it together and integrates it using Fount, which then ultimately enables an insight layer which pulls from all of these different models and integrates it in one central platform where you can ask the questions that you need to do to keep your financial services organizations, uh, organization safe. We're a team with a very, very diverse skill set. Myself and Sheldon, we've actually done this together. We built this at PwC, um, and then also a team with experience in design and business development. So thank you very much. Here's our ask, and appreciate it. Any questions? Can you clarify where the current uh, automated solution is at from a go-to-market standpoint and how many stakeholders within certain organizations are using it and all that? Yeah, uh, thanks, Giuseppe. Um, so the current situation is that we've got is, that is a, it's a departure from, it's a different solution that we're currently working on, just to clarify, it, is a, it was my previous role. Um, so currently they, I honestly haven't, when I left the organization, we had about 17 clients um, onboarded, more or less, uh, across a few different sectors, including banking, insurance, asset management, as well as mining. Um, so those were sectors, it was full, it was live, it was operating, it was generating revenue with about seven different applications actually running on top of the core platform. 
Um, can you clarify a little bit about the scale up of this? Uh, how much of this is services versus product that can be rolled out much quickly? Yeah, so it's uh, it, fundamentally the product itself is a platform, but the platform is then used to actually build the services itself. So in other words, we provide the platform layer and our clients would ultimately do the services themselves. So we, how we would scale is at a product level and at a software level, but the individuals using the platform would actually then scale their services using the product, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah. one, two, three. Nice. Get louder, one, two, three. Nice. Okay. Thank you. That's a good appeal. I think. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Jessica, and I'm a master's student in computational biology, and my co-founders and I are building HealthSync to unlock private and efficient crowdsource data access for healthcare developers. Oh. Did you know that it takes over four months to integrate health data into a digital health app? And health apps are not going away. That's because people like you and I want to take control over our own health and our own health data. In fact, over half of the US adult population has used a health-related app just last year, and that number is only continuing to grow. But building a health app is an incredibly complicated and fragmented process. Integrating numerous consumer health data sources requires individual endpoint integration, manual organization of all your data, and going through the difficult process of, of developing privacy. And developers agree. In fact, some have had to hire others just to take care of this process. But what if data could be aggregated, organized, and privacy enabled in a simple manner so that developers could instead focus on building the health app that we all need? That's what we're building with HealthSync. Our initial MVP focused on enabling developers to simply select the subtypes of data that they want for HealthKit for immediately usable code. And we're not stopping there. Our vision is to build the Fivetran for healthcare by being this connective tissue for all of the siloed data sources that exist out there. From there, we can augment the developer experience so they can build more sophisticated healthcare applications faster and easier. Of course, we're not the only players in the space, but the majority of competitors focus on clinical data. That means they're targeting physicians and hospitals and not necessarily developers who are building applications for URI. In fact, the few people that do play in the same realm as us don't provide nearly enough data to be useful for developers. So with HealthSync, we'll be prioritizing data availability right off the bat. Now, digital health is, of course, an enormous market. So where do we start? We're going to be aiming at a $6 billion opportunity focused on early stage consumer healthcare developers. These are predominantly startups, so they need to move incredibly fast, and they acutely face the problem of the slowness of data integration. So we'll be targeting them, and our priority will be to emphasize engagement and adoption. So we'll be taking a very simple business model to start with by providing tiered pricing. From there, that'll allow us to accelerate our learning, and we'll develop it as we go. Now, we all love a big market, but you need the right team to make it happen. We have Jessica leading our technical development with her background in computer science and her current focus on computation biology. And we have Zeb and Alina, who between them have extensive founding and product experience. And then I round out the team with my learnings at AWS and Amgen, where I can hopefully help inform how we build this developer platform and get it out to market. We're currently considering raising angel funding to bring on an additional developer to accelerate our development and take us to the next stage. Uh, so feel free to scan that QR code if you want to reach out. Thank you. Exciting, um, really exciting idea. I'm curious how you will navigate the healthcare privacy, how you'll navigate the healthcare privacy regulations, HIPAA, and so forth. Um, you've got user generated data or enter data perhaps, but beyond that, what other data would you collect and how would you navigate that environment? So we don't actually store any of our own data, we just pass it through. We're trying to figure out exactly whether we're going to have our clients bear the brunt of the, the HIPAA stuff or we'll do that. And likely we're considering in our tiers. Uh, including that in a higher price tier, or premium tier, or customized tier, make it easier for them because part of the customization we'll have in the higher tiers is cleaning up the data and making it more organized for them, which is also an issue. So that's probably something that we'll include going forward, but otherwise for the free tier, for example, the open source community tier, probably that won't be a, a big concern for us. Yeah, killer, killer presentation, guys. And I know it inspired a lot of people that I know over here. Um, 
So you, you said you're gonna start, the, you made the market very, very clear, and then you said you're gonna start with small customers and then work up to the big ones, but you didn't explain why. Why, why not start with big ones and work toward the small ones? So the customers that we're starting with right now is the early stage founders, They're very small teams. And if you saw in the beginning, we have through our customer discovery, we interviewed dozens of developers. Integrating this data is a huge issue. And for our early stage founders, they're hiring developers, they're wasting time, two, three developers, just to integrate, for example, health kit data, which is where we're focusing our MVP on, at least in the beginning. And that's a much bigger pressure point for early stage founders when they're concerned about hiring two developers for $200,000 rather than a massive company that doesn't really care as much, at least at this point. And then we can always go from there, focus on research, get providing this data to train ML models and many other applications. So everybody wants more easily data access. Okay, so one, two, three. Nice. All right, so off stage, uh, Arai, Gregory, uh, and team. So I also want to point out we, we're looking at the judges scored. Everyone's, we have 35 judges. They've scored for everyone, so we're seeing the, the leader. It's top secret. We have security over there and everything. Um, Pulkit, can you raise your hand? So um, if you're an instructor in this class, you know what, raise your hand. Yeah, so he's going to be a new instructor next semester. He's from EECS and CCL, and we're branching out. This is a way that we could be the best uh, venture studio in the history of the, the galaxy. So Pulkit, thank you for, for coming by. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Okay, Air AI, go. Hi, my name is Georgi Karpenko. I'm an architect from Harvard Graduate School of Design, and today I will tell you about Air AI, a platform for sharing building health information. We spend 90% of our time indoors, and these spaces are actually affecting us. You remember the smog and air pollution that is happening every year in California, or Flint water crisis, which is targeting DC right now. But not only during crises, Four out of five homes have allergens in at least one bedroom, and one of 15 has excessive levels of radon, which is a radioactive gas, very dangerous for our health. We're basing our approach on the nine foundations of a healthy building, a strategy developed in Harvard Chan School of Public Health, which is measuring nine parameters of a building that are telling us if it's healthy or not. Air quality, water quality, noise, light, and others. We're creating a platform that is allowing users to upload information about building health and through that create a map of indoor health. We're creating a Zillow for healthy buildings. The first stage will give users the opportunity to share this data and we will incentivize them through tokens and by providing devices to share this data to our platform. During the second stage, we will sell this database to government, consumers, building owners, or health insurances. Here is our device. It's measuring air quality, but potentially it could also measure temperature, humidity, and other parameters of your space. It could be potentially implemented into iPhone cases or smartwatches or other portable devices. And here's how it works with our app. The first stage, choose the plan. Depending on your plan, you will receive different types of devices to measure the space parameters around you. Then, during the measurement, during your day, you will receive the information and then have a report every day about your health indoor parameters. The competitive landscape is free. There's nobody doing the platform like this right now. But working together with certification, consultancy, and smart devices, we believe that we actually can build a healthy building environment. Our team will make it happen. I hope it will appear here. And uh, Daniela has an experience in government. Alibek is a sustainable investor, but also we have I, who doing a consultancy, and Ahmad, who is responsible for technical side of our project. We're raising an angel round right now and also looking for introductions to hardware manufacturers and portable devices to potentially partner with them. The buildings that we are shaping in the future will shape us. Let's build a healthy building environment together. Thank you. Who wants to ask questions? So, uh, judges, stand up. Who wants to ask questions? Okay, anyone else? Bueller, Bueller. You're asking users to upload the data. You've got the device. Why not just be a nest for this uh, health data for that and then you already have everything? Uh, so there, right now there are not enough devices to actually upload this data to no, the- You're developing right now, but you go like nest, you know, uh, for that. 
So you already have everything. It's Wi-Fi connected. You have the device. So, you know, uh, uploading users may not be you know kind of doing that. So, so suggestion. I see. I see. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just curious, what kind of? Your name in oh, Millie Liu from First Star Ventures. Uh, what kind of data do you actually collect from your device? Uh, so right now it's air quality. It's based on the volatile organic matter, which is the main parameter of air quality index right now. It also could measure the dust and pests in the air, and potentially we're uh, wor working to measure the air, uh, the humidity, temperature, and potentially water quality, CO2 levels. All right, one, two, three. Yes. Okay, so this is our sixth company. We have eight more after this. Gabriella from Peru, uh, MIT, uh, fancy student. Bust the move. Stay in the black square. Because we're, we're streaming, we have about 10,000 people on the stream. Okay, perfect. No <laughs> no well, hi, I'm Gabriella, and I want to introduce you to Jane. Jane is unfulfilled with her, with her therapy experience. She's stressed. And sadly, we have more people like Jane, like more than 50% drop therapy appointments even before starting it. Another 30% drop after the first therapy appointment just because the experience was terrible. So what is this happening? Because therapists are overwhelmed. They cannot fulfill patients' needs and expectations while keeping like all the patients they have to, 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 to attend, right? So, and to have the big picture of what is happening, this is the average journey of a patient in the United States. As you see, like there are a lot of pain points. You can see the two drop rates, like very, very uh, critical. And that's because you have waiting times up to 12 weeks. And as I said, terrible experience during the first appointment. Oh, okay. So that's why they need Embrace. They need someone to engage them, to make this experience better. We are an AI-powered therapist copilot designed to create a new therapy experience, and it's both for patients and for therapists. So with Embrace, they are going to be able to jump a start since the first call, their healing process, while they are waiting. Patients are going to boost the self-awareness through their own data. Also, therapists are going to have this copilot that is going to give them insights to provide better guidance to their patients. And the best thing is that it's going to be very protected. Like, data is completely protected for both of them. So let's see how is Jane gonna, how is Jane's journey going to be now that she has Embrace. She's going to call. She's going to sign up for an appointment. And while she's waiting, she's going to kick start her healing process through several self-awareness techniques that AI is going to help us to build. It can be with an avatar, a storytelling, generative AI. It's going to be customized according to Jane's needs and profile. Then the moment of truth comes the first therapy appointment. So here, the therapist is not going to start from zero. It's going to have insights that Jane feel in the, in, during the waiting time to provide better guidance. And that doesn't end there. In between sessions, Jane is going to be able to continue and, and, and evolving her process. And the therapist is going to keep having insights that is going to use during the therapy sessions. So our vision is to start our MVP and testing this with independent therapists and coaches that they need it already. And it's going to be a safe environment both for patients and, to the, and from therapy to therapy with therapists to, for us to test it. Then we are going to be able to jump it uh, with patients, individual patients, adding more AI features that is going to help to enhance the experience. And then we are going to be able to get to our main goal, which is be a B2B that provide this platform to mental health providers and insurance companies. So so we can reach the people that is in most need. So, uh, well, we have an MIT, MIT Media Lab, and Harvard team that has all the needed skills to scale and build Embrace and make it a reality for the people that really need it. So uh, visit our website. Uh, please uh, sign up if you are an investor interested in mental health and as passionate as us, and visit us through our booth. We have a demo there with the video and all the platforms that you can see. Thank you so much. who is a co-founder and an alum of this class whose company's doing great, is going to be helping with the mics. And when you, judges, when you say something, please identify yourself. And I noticed the last one, only 33 of you applied, uh, voted, so two of you abstained. All right. Hey, Dave London. Uh, so I happen to know that you have a core AI platform technologist expert on your team. Uh, and uh, what are you going to do? These foundation models are famous for being right 99% of the time, but then being really confidently wrong 
1% of the time. And if you're dealing with something like therapy, how are you going to deal with the fact that it could actually give really bad advice once in a while? Yeah, I think that's why, uh, often you can take it, but I think like that's why you cannot leave this to a patient on their own. That's why mental health uh, apps that try to replace therapies have this problem. But here you have a safe space for the therapist, so the therapist can still use their critical thinking to advise the person. And after training the model, I think we can be able to jump to independent patients, but at the beginning, no. So um, from a technology standpoint, I believe probably in three to five years, uh, a large angry model can be trained for each person uh, individually on maybe just your iPhone. So we believe if we collect enough data from the patient, we can personalize that language model just for the patient. So it will be more, um, um, yeah, uh, better to fit uh, the patient's need and avoid mistakes. Hi, I'm John Sharp. I'm a physician. I have a quick question. Does all the information that you're collecting from the patient require the patient to actively input it? Or are there passive you know, observations that you could collect, say, the activity of the patient just based on the movement of the phone? What, what's the breakdown of passive versus active data? Yes, at the beginning, it requires like patient's input. Uh, but then we want to connect it with other apps, for example, Spotify, because music can give you some insights of the profile, but double check by the therapist during the session. And then we can think in those features when we advance with this, no? But it has to be like increment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. One, two, three. Nice. All right, tailbox. Azerbaijan and Brazil. Brazil, yes. And a big thing on graduation. Yeah, so many of us may have been in the Boston Common Garden before. What can you tell me about this bench? It seems a very regular bench, right? Well, let me tell you the story behind this bench. This is actually the bench where Robbie Williams and Matt Damon recorded one of the most famous scenes in Hollywood story. And just like as this place, there are many stories just waiting to be told, doesn't matter where you go in the world. And that's why we created Tailbox. Tailbox is a mix of Foursquare and Pokemon Go for travel exploration. We are using generative AI and a social platform to create all these hidden gems and tell unique stories about the world. Let's see how it works. Imagine it as you are walking in the street, Tailbox is in your ear, trying to teach you interesting things that you might like about this place. Whether you are a foodie, a tech enthusiast, or you like ghost stories. And the best part is that you can actually engage with the AI in a conversation. So let's say if you are in Boston Common, you can be in a conversation with a native Indian, explaining interesting things that you might like about this place and asking questions and follow up with him. And with technology that we have today, we can scale very quickly, which means that you can go to Boston five, six, 10 times and have a completely new experience every time that you go. In our business model, um, so this is a huge market. Uh, it's $1.1 trillion only in the United States alone of people every year looking for new experience and places to go. In our business model, we are free, play to earn for our users. So we are rewarding people by traveling, by engaging with content, by leaving tips and recommendations to other users. And for the business, this is a completely new channel of engagement with their customers because they are able now to create their own stories and their own challenges for the users. And we have a vo very powerful way to have a localized advertisement. We are driving people traffic to these locations and we can choose the right person the right time to reach them. So why now? Um, yeah, uh, more than half the people we see in the streets use headphones now. And this has changed a lot over the years. There are like uh, innovation in the, uh, in the LLM technologies that enables uh, us to create and scale these stories very fast. And the natural language processing helps with making it natural sounding. So we have a team of, um, our team cumulatively has seven years of experience in AI product at IBM. Uh, we also built before a platform with 5,000 paying customers, and we uh, already recruited three technical developers from uh, MIT. Um, yeah, uh, so we are set to join uh, MIT Accelerator for the summer. And uh, we are going to start niche. We are going to, just like Facebook, we are going to start niche, and. 
scale. We are focusing on MIT and Harvard at the start, uh, which see 8 million user, uh, visitors annually. We're asking for investment to build our technical team, uh, the product, brand, and marketing. Um, and yeah, um, Tailbox is not just an, uh, another application. Uh, we are revolutionizing the way people uh, interact with their surroundings. So just like in the uh, early days of generative AI, um, just like in the early days of generative, uh, early days of internet, Google transformed how people, uh, which people's behavior on how they do search. We're doing, doing the same thing in the early days of generative AI uh, with how people explore and discover the world. Thank you very much. All right, so um, the venture capitalists in the first two rows here represent at least four billion of capital. And I think they all love returns. Uh, and I've watched how much progress you've made during the semester while taking other classes, and you actually have a, a very clear vision for what you want on graduation day. But with 500 grand, uh, how much progress can you make given the amount of progress you've made in the last semester? Yeah, so the, the big, the, the most important thing is that with generative AI, we can actually do these things in like weeks, not years. So right now we are developing an MVP that is gonna tell all these stories that we have about MIT and we're doing it in three weeks. We have a very important date, which is 1st of June, graduation, 500 families are coming. So we want to reach all these people and tell all the interesting things that we have in MIT. So, all right. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, both of you stand up. I go first. Okay. Um, hi. This is this, this is awesome. This Ronald Al Kalyubi. Um, spun out of here. It's great to be back. Um, so my question for you: Can I have Matt Damon tell me the story <laughs> using generative AI? Yeah. You'll make that happen. Yes. Uh, Perfect. So <laughs> do you want to talk about this? So this is the second very good thing about generative AI. Like we can have very immersive voices. We tested it, it's working. We can have character voices. So imagine that if you go to Boston Common, you can sit on the bench and you can ask questions to Matt Damon. He can answer how was the movie created? How was the scene that was happening over there? And imagine that you can do at scale. So if you like Albert Einstein, you are visiting MIT, you might want to know about the time that he was here and he can guide you through this experience. So it's really immersive. Love it. Five, two, three. Nice. Seven. Uh, <laughs> presentation, seven more to go. Ramesh has something to say at the midpoint. All right. We are, we are halfway here. It's just amazing to see these teams just in eight weeks coming up with a direction. Of course, ways to go before market sizing and financials, but let's just congratulate all the teams so far. <laughs> so we have a, a two-minute break. Um, in the meantime, just stretch, stand up and stretch. Uh, follow live on tiny.cc slash MIT May 11, uh, online and here. You can enter comments, write suggestions, there's a Google Doc, and so on. And uh, while you're stretching, I'm going to invite a couple of uh, investors to just come and tell us about, uh, come and tell us about their background, uh, just 30 seconds, and their impression about the team so far. Hi everyone, my name is Jaden Bryden. I'm an investor at X Fund, um, and we are investing in founders coming out of the university context. And so, really excited to meet the teams today. So far, they've been amazing. What, what should they, for the remaining teams, what should they do differently? Um, I would say for the remaining teams, um, continue to be confident. Everyone is doing really well. You know the story, you've been working on this, you're an expert, don't hesitate, um, and have fun with it. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs>
we're going to start in a minute. We're going to get started. Have a seat. If you want to get her autograph. Hi. Yeah. She's, my arm. <laughs> yeah, no, she's a major player. Wait, did you tell her what you're doing? We can tell her right now. Or I don't want to interrupt it. All right, we're starting. <laughs> but we are, we're building in fertility. Yes, yes. I'm going to invite um, a few uh, investors and mentors to just share their thoughts so far and uh, a little bit about themselves as well. Uh, starting with uh, Rana, who's actually a former PhD student right here at MIT Media Lab and has an amazing journey as an inventor, as an entrepreneur, uh, and now as an investor. Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Rana al Kalyubi. I spun out of the MIT Media Lab in 2009, my company Affectiva, just around here from the Affective Computing Group. It is wonderful to be back. Um, I sold my company about two years ago, and I'm now spending a lot of time um, being back at MIT. And I also teach at Harvard, and I'm doing a lot of investing in early stage AI startups. I have to say, there is something magical about this stage where you guys are at. Um, there's deep conviction, there's passion, there's excitement, um, and you're trying to take a path that nobody's taken before, and, and I think it's really contagious, and I feel very grateful to be uh, part of this as a mentor and a judge. Um, I will say to the judges, um, this, the company stages, it's super early, right? Like, don't judge them as you would as a typical kind of venture pitch. Um, these companies are about to be incubated, um, but I think they've made a ton of progress from what I've seen over the last uh, few months. So very excited to be here. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to the next batch of pitches. Thank you, Rana. Uh, inviting uh, Milo Werner from uh, a GP at, at uh, MIT Engine. Hi, morning. Um, oh my gosh, this is just really exciting. I love the creativity. Um, I think the teams have done a really amazing job of kind of like mapping the market, thinking what could be impactful, um, developing creative solutions, and then you know putting the pitch together is no easy job. So awesome work putting together amazing pitches. Thank you. Thank and MIT Engine is going to do more AI, I hope. <laughs> Uh, Milly Liu from First Star Ventures, uh, investor in uh, early stage AI uh, data computing technology with a deep technical barrier. Um, over 10 years ago, I was not exactly in this room, but somewhere on MIT campus pitching um, when I started my first company in uh, machine learning. And I was really impressed today by all the founders, how uh, given rather short period of time, you know, there's really like a complete team, complete vision, and the, the pitches are uh, rather mature and uh, well, it's really exciting to see how uh, the students on campus are building um, companies that are getting to be quite real. Thank you. Thank you, Millie. Uh, and then we have John Horton, you know, the founder of Mass Challenge and now a general partner at Two Lantern. Thank you. Uh, awesome to be here. Again, John Harthorn, founder managing director of Two Lanterns Seed Fund in Boston uh, and founder of Mass Challenge before that. There's no place in the world like MIT for producing massive ideas, and that's my favorite part about this, and seeing people really expand the possibility uh, and the realm of possibility with their ideas. And as Rana noted, pretty early stage startups, but still thinking super big, and frankly, really thoughtful uh, plans for uh, accomplishing that impact. That's the only way that it gets done. And I would say my key advice for everybody is uh, continue to think big. In fact, try to multiply by 10 and see how that would change your approach to it, because almost always uh, it will at least double what you think is possible. So just keep thinking big, expanding, expanding, and just keep running for it. I love it, and uh, happy to talk to anybody. John at 2L.VC, thanks. All right, you guys, judges, 35 of you, stand up and just do a 360 so uh, you can, uh, everyone can see you. Uh, and there's no, um, no lobbying these judges. Uh, thank you for voting, uh, thank you for being awesome. All right, uh, Ray, next company. Jason and Blake. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Jason, an incoming uh, student at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. I've developed devices in optics and chemistry and worked in tech policy, but today I'm excited to tell you about Ray. 
My passion started when someone I care about forgot who I am. You see, my grandmother, seated here, an otherwise healthy, avid golfer, suddenly lost her memory to dementia. Alzheimer's affects one in every three people over 85. Care is uh, expensive and tough. People like my grandmother feel frustrated and lonely. Care is time consuming and, and demanding for families and caregivers. That's why Ray is here. Ray is an AI co-pilot for, for people with cognitive impairment. It provides orientation, interaction, and entertainment, supporting families and caregivers. At Ray, we call my grandmother a rock star. People that support her, their caregivers, are her band. And families are her fans, and the data sources and uh, entertainment services are her instruments, providing optimal care. With constant monitoring, um, Ray provides uh, alerts and insights for optimal care, and Ray never gets frustrated and provides uh, support with empathy. So for example, in the morning, Ray greets rock stars and asks them how they're doing and see if they need anything. When Ray hears uh, cries for help, it asks uh, what's going on and it alerts caregivers or the band. And when Ray hears frustration, then Ray speaks with the rock stars and calms them down. So how does Ray do this? Uh, my co-founder, um, Blake, is going to describe this. Thanks, Jason. Hi, everyone, I'm Blake. I'm an Army veteran and a mechanical engineer getting my MBA at MIT Sloan. So some of the tech uh, behind Ray has been years in the making. We're all aware that now it's quickly and cheaply uh, able to be rolled out. So we'll be using a voice activated speech to text. So the text will then be analyzed with a large language model and provide responses to our rock stars. The responses will be fine tuned to ensure safety. There'll be very limited suggestibility in these responses. But on the back end, it will be integrated with a platform for the band and the fans, family caregivers to see suggestions or timely alerts to respond to the patient's needs. If we look at the competitive landscape, we're not the first AI voice assistant, and there's even some in the space of elder care. However, uh, one example is LEQ in the bottom left, where they are a more standalone hardware-based solution. They have received a $167 million valuation after Series B, so there's some proof of success in this field, but we see our app-based interoperable platform that provides proactive solutions to patients as a, as a differentiator, and we'll be using a B2B SaaS approach to uh, limit capital expenditure. So we have the team to do this uh, with Jason and myself. We also are lucky to have Jessica uh, computational biology uh, uh, graduate student at Harvard. So she'll be working as an advisory engineer and we're lucky to have some top experts in AI and venture, Talib and Amr as our advisors. Our next steps are gonna be to build an MVP to pilot this with care centers. We're also gonna add some more interoperability and more customization and introduce uh, a tie into existing caregiver systems. So that's, uh, that's all we have. Thank you for your time. We're currently raising uh, angel round. So if you'd like to join our team or have any questions, please follow this QR code. And uh, thank you for listening. Any questions? Sure, over here. Um, so what, what data platforms um, and uh, devices do you need to integrate with? So we haven't uh, picked one yet. We're gonna try to be as broad as- No, 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 I mean like there are a whole bunch of devices, right? Healthcare devices in home that provide data as well as data platforms and sources, right? So it's not like you're gonna integrate into one. You're gonna, you have to integrate into like a dozen of these things. Do you, can you just give us a sense as to the scale of that? Yeah, it would be interoperable. So it could connect with Apple Health. It connects with the Internet of Things. So uh, Google Home, Apple Home. Um, also entertainment systems, Netflix, Disney, Disney Plus, we're going to uh, ensure interoperability. Um, the, and we're also not gonna be focused on just one device and be married to that. We're gonna be agnostic as far as to which, uh, which devices we partner with. Thank you. Um, great presentation. Are you prioritizing any? Oh, Giuseppe Studio, 186 Ventures. Um, are you prioritizing any particular demographic within the scope of Rockstars? 
And how do you think about that problem set as yeah, we, you kind of test out and so on? Yeah, definitely. We have an introduction that's promising uh, with uh, a company that provides service to veterans. Uh, so um, this they would provide service to uh, veteran care centers. Um, so that's one. We also have a community um, that provides support, and that's another one we look to pilot. Okay. One, two, three. Nice. Okay, in two pitches from now, we have a robot that's going to come out here. Ladies and gentlemen, our next company, number nine. Hi, everyone. My name is Kian. I'm really excited to introduce this idea to amazing you guys. Our solution called the Age. We are personalized private crowdsourcing AI platform to solve longevity problem. This is a one month ago article. This is a talk about a drug, but despite uh, some popular professionals and advocates taking a medicine for longevity, a new study last year found that it didn't increase the lifespan and even might have some negative effect. This is another article talk about another drug. Sorry. Hmm. A lot of overwhelming and controversial information on longevity existed, but, and also there is no uh, reliable personalized AI solutions. And so we wanted to solve this problem by crowdsourcing AI solution. <clears throat> Our crowdsourcing AI solution can solve this problem by, oh, oh yeah, solution? Yes, oh sorry, oh my god. <laughs> yes. Let's do a round of applause. By collective learning to identify gap in researchers and individuals and um, create, develop new insights and cure, cure, curable, uh, reliable solutions for longevity. It also developed Im improved an, an estimated age modeling, which is related to age-related disease. It resulted in improved the research, um, research result. Yes. Um, and also, the longevity solution really requires a long-term engagement, so we will impl implement this incentivized structure for our solution. What makes us different and why now? There are a lot of various longevity solutions, such as biological clocks and genetics, a lot of diagnosed solutions. But all solutions are fragmented and there is no holistic solution in the market. And also, it means the more solutions, more data, more overwhelming. So we will provide a crowdsourcing platform to make a crowdsourcing and develop reliable solutions. And why now? A lot of researchers are professionals, even develop their supplements. It means they also needed to personalize it, reliable solutions. We are target market, our target market is US, Korea, Taiwan, Japan. In, uh, that countries are fast aging country and people most over 10 years suffered from aging and disability problems. We are, our strategy is three-phase strategy. We want to focus in on engaging people first and then expected uh, if, mm, network effect, uh, collective learning effect, and then we want to scaling up in, by integrating more advanced cutting-edge longevity treatment. We're focusing on develop holistic lifestyle management solution because even though the lifestyle management is really key factors for longevity, but there is no comprehensive solution aligned with longevity. And we will integrate the tokenized services to promote it in, uh, to contributors to overcome the cold start problem. Um, Aging problem is really social problem, so you are not alone. We will solve this humanities problem together by crowdsourcing AI solution. Our team, each of us, I and Sandra, has a lot of 
over 10 years, corporate strategy experiences and also develops sophisticated systems. And also we have AI specialists in our team. Let's talk about more and let's try to solve this humanities problem together. Thank you. Uh, Susan Garfield, uh, Public Health EY. Um, great idea, great presentation. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Um, I think everyone in the front of this room really wants you to succeed because we don't want to get old because we are. Um, so tell me a little bit more about how you're going to separate the craziness from the real true signals. How does your platform help us know what really works? Um, yes, we will receive input from the biological Bike marker, including body marker and lifestyle factors, and we will develop um, long-term tracing the markers enhancement, and we will um, found out the gaps within the research data. I think that's the problem because some suggestions are too biased, some some ethnic or some lifestyle and some age groups. So we need to adjust all these kinds of research data. Um, for personalizing, it's especially the geological base placement or like the yeah, gender like that, this kinds of big gap exists in the data. So we will adjust that, yeah, for personal personalized yeah, algorithm. Thank you. Okay, one, two, three. Yes. All right, I told you there might be a robot, so I'm not surprised. Ladies and gentlemen, Yogi. Yes. So Lagar, and this is uh, MIT founder founded this particular company. <laughs> Hello everyone, a show of hands if you had to wait at a restaurant just like this. Like waiting for food, thank you. That's because of extreme labor shortage, not only in restaurants, but across the service industry, increasing wages, Declining profits, that's the same story. Kenny is a real person, by the way. He's an award-winning barbecue chef. He had to shut down his restaurant because of labor shortage. On the other hand, John, he had the same problem. So he had robots, and his business is thriving. Next time you go to a restaurant, Flippy is going to make your fries, Alfred will mix your bowl, and mix what? We'll fix your cocktail, and Bella brings it to you. She's really sweet, okay? So don't forget to tip her. Uh, and with AI, there'll be an exponential increase in the number of robots, just like this. And the restaurant owner would be super confused. There are so many options. What should I buy? How can I afford to buy? That's where we come in, Soul Good. Service robot for hire. We are like Zillow for service robots. We work with the restaurant owner, understand their needs, suggest the right mix, and offer the robots on a pay-per-use basis. From a business standpoint, we are managing utilization risk. Hi, I'm Yogi. I'm a risk manager and an expander. I started my first company out of IIT. And after a MBA, I got some solid experience with banks. Now, I want to start again. I spoke to a lot of people over the past couple of months. And from what I understand, people prefer a robot as a service at low volume. And there is a lot of potential for service sector robots. So we partner with robot manufacturers, provide support on sales and financing, and offer robot and offer service robot for hire to operators. How we do it? We do it with usage-based financing, supported by AI-driven risk models, and we manage risk with diversification. Our teammate Iki built a UX of how Sophia, a Mexican food joint owner, can overcome labor shortage. She can come to a portal, check for all the robots, pick one, apply for credit and monitor the robots on the same platform. There is only one competitor in the market, Formic. But they are on the other end, high volume industrial segment, we want to focus on the low end service segment. Uh, think about the place around you. For every restaurant, if you have two or three robots, and every commercial, has two, uh, commercial place has two or three robots around you, that's our target market. It's really huge. 
We were looking to raise a pre-seed to test the market and build an MVP. We have advisors on service pricing, circular economy, investment management, and equipment finance risk management. So once we are done building the company, if a couple of students from Harvard and MIT come together to build a service robot, we can instantly provide them access to national wide market. And my dear friends, that's the power of soul good. Thank you. Hi, Jaden Bryden. Um, I am curious, what is the onboarding process for these different companies? So like, if Pokeworks wanted to rent a robot today, would it take weeks to train, minutes to train, hours? What is that process? Sure. Once we work with a restaurant, like first we'll uh, work with them and understand their exact needs because it has to complement their human workers that's already there. You're not replacing them. So it will probably take us maximum a week for us to install the robot and get people acquainted with it. And over time, we can decrease the time. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. Hi. This is Beth Porter. I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm wondering that you You're describe. <laughs> Uh, you describe, uh, you showed the app, which is this onboarding experience, but you keep talking about having it be very much a service-oriented uh, view of your company. You're going to talk to the owner, you're going to work with the owner. Wh which is, where's the greater emphasis? Is it one and then the other? Is it one and, and, and later you move into an app? I'm just a little bit confused by that sure. part. Yeah. So initially, it would be more of like people-to-people -people experience because they have to be comfortable with the robots. So, like once and there, are, uh, there is that critical mass that is comfortable with robots around them, then we can make it more automatic. But initially it is more of like, hey, uh, do you think this robot works for you? How does it complement your people? And does it actually uh, be an addition for you? That's our approach. Great. All right. One, two, three. Yes. All right. So our, here, our next speaker came to every class with his dog, Soho. Soho is pitching another venture somewhere Thank else, you. I think. He's not with us today, but he's fine. Thanks. Don't be alarmed. Thanks, John. Gentlemen. Thank you. How can I follow the Boston Dynamics dog, man? This is so unfair. Seriously. All right. Uh, my name is Amr. I'm a computer engineer by degree. I have a master's in computer science, master's in management, and currently finishing my MPA at Harvard. Uh, I used to work for the IMF, uh, the World Bank, Obama campaign as a senior field advisor, and most recently Amazon as a principal product manager. Uh, one of my earliest inventions in social entrepreneurship was uh, called Emergency uh, BNB. It aimed at being an Airbnb for refugees and domestic violence victims. We were loaded all over media outlets around the world uh, where people came to uh, host a refugee for free out of sheer kindness. Uh, I realized in the process that capitalizing on people's kindness as an innovator is uh, not enough. Uh, so this time around, I decided to create this uh, uh, company where not only are we adding value to charity, but also people who are uh, raising funds to charity. Um, so uh, micro influencers are going to sell products, uh, and the sales uh, part of the sales will the revenue will go to, to them and to the product company and to the charity. It's a more pragmatic, more sustainable uh, way of doing social work, and also obviously to the investors who are making all of this possible. Wink, wink. Uh, <laughs> micro influencers actually uh, generate a lot more engagement and sales than real influencers. We will talk about the data afterwards. Uh, but I figured if we can use AI to analyze a micro influencers page, realize what products they might be able to sell, what products might complement their online presence and persona, and then send them that product link. All they have to do is post it on their Instagram. When somebody buys, they make a percentage, we make a percentage, and charity makes a percentage. As a result, we had to think of uh, uh, industries with high profit margins. In America, the largest profit margins is digital products, uh, pharmaceuticals, and beauty industry. This is the sale of one perfume uh, bottle. It costs five dollars to make it sells for $75 gigantic profit margin and if you are Tom Ford you will sell it for $500 so imagine the potential 100,000 influencers by the way this is less than 1% of uh, uh, the, the monthly active users of Instagram in America alone imagine each one of them sells only one perfume per month that's 90 million dollars a year in mostly profit margin again the cost of goods sold is only 10% so you can give 70 million to charity you are still left with 20 million to, to split between your cost and, and your influencers etc but if is this something uh, micro influencers actually like 
uh, let's see, we, we ran an experiment. We go to a, a product company that, that makes perfumes we, that are willing to white label. Um, uh, and we find Lena. She has 10,000 10, followers. She's a micro-influencer. Uh, her page suggested that she is a dancer. So Bailarina was the name that was generated by AI. ChatGPT generated the entire description. She loves it so much, flatters her in many ways. She posts it on her Instagram. Same thing happened with uh, this gentleman, Joe, uh, um, post ma made also a perfume. You realize that micro-influencers have other micro-influencer friends. So you get a second layer of free advertising, uh, completely free. This guy was vouching for his, there's no audio, was vouching for his friend's uh, 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 perfume, all for free. We haven't paid anything for this advertising. The power of micro-influencers and network, the power of network. Uh, they love it so much, they say, uh, I, I created a perfume that adds 10% to the, in, in domestic violence. So not only are they making money, they, this is also an intrinsic value to their own online persona that people love so much and say, thank you for making the world a better place. Uh, in fact, they love it so much that they will create a, 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 a perfume a commercial about it. This is very tasteful. You can scan it here and watch all of it, or maybe after. Uh, it, they love it so much that they write articles about their, their perfume lunch and how it's making the world a better place. This is free advertising, uh, making a lot of money. Imagine we just want them to send one bottle per month. The sales were obviously, obviously a lot more than one bottle per month. Um, this is the perfume for Daria. Um, so this is the sales for only three people. These are people who never sold anything online, suddenly making $1,700 a week. Uh, we are empowering them also as, as part of the segment we are helping. Um, so this is how it works. We generate this by AI. Done? OK. Uh, we, can, we can cover this in the Q&A, but uh, it's self-explanatory. You pick a, select a product, select a charity, launch a campaign, and then you launch it online. And this is how it works. Uh, any question? Who's excited about it? So you're, you had to move really quickly through that, but you have actual revenue, which is pretty yeah. pretty amazing during a semester. Uh, tell us how that, that revenue builds into the 90 million that you were talking about. Yeah. So so these are if you if you if you look at this, 500 dollars is only seven bottles. So that's about 75 dollar per bottle, as we mentioned. So imagine 100,000 micro influencers in America. There is 130 million inf uh, Instagram users. Let's say two million of them are micro influencers, people who have like 10 10,000 followers. Two million. We capitalize only in five percent of this two million. So only 100,000 micro influencers we are trying to onboard. And we asked him the very simple ask of selling one perfume per month. They ended up selling a lot more in one week. So I'm just giving you the very low estimate of selling one perfume per month. You get 90 million a year in mostly profit margin. Uh, so, so this is how it, it adds up to uh, 90 million. Yeah. One, two, three. Nice. Okay. So um, we have th our th three last ones. I've tallied it up. We've had 422 votes so far, so thank you, judges. Judges, stand up and bow, we'll, just for a second. Yeah. It's, yeah. Okay. So, so they've crushed some dreams today, and they're also making some dreams. All right, so um, this guy went to Yale and went to Penn Business School, so he has blue in him, and he's at uh, Harvard Law School. He's teaming up with this Sloney. Ladies and gentlemen, blue. Thank you, John. In partnership with the Cambridge, oh, this isn't us. Oh, we thought we'd give you a different deck. <laughs> we can handle it. Karaoke, deck karaoke. Uh, do we have the deck ready? Let's just, yeah. Check right, these. All right, we're giving you a quick preview. All right. In partnership with the Cambridge Police Department, we are excited to present Blue. Our mission is to save lives by putting critical information at the fingertips of every first responder. Hello, my name is David Lawrence. I'm a Harvard Wharton JD MBA and formerly Deputy Budget Director to the Governor of Connecticut. I'm Hunter Goodson, an MIT MBA, and most recently led a billion dollar PL at Southwest Airlines. Our CTO is Amit, who is formerly a senior software engineer at Google and machine learning. Our advisors include police advisors, uh, uh, police commanders, police training officers, directors of training, and more. And we have an active partnership with Cambridge, which allows us full access to their command staff. I'd like to start today by just asking for a show of hands. Who here thinks that policing in this country needs to improve? I think we all agree. So how can we do this? 
We're gonna take a lesson from surgeons who cut their mistake rate in half by simply consulting checklists before each surgery. In the same spirit as that, we are building a tool that provides critical information to first responders right at the moment where they need it the most. How would that look? We're gonna show you. Do we have audio? Let's get some audio. Is there no How audio? How do I talk to video? her? Pause to assess situation. Maintain safe distance. Reassure you are there to help. Speak calmly and ask questions. Don't talk down. Avoid excitement and disperse crowds. Seek assistance from professionals. Hey, Blue. Um, I got a call of a, a missing autistic child. I'm looking for the child. When I find her, uh, how do I approach her? Respect personal space. Remain calm, patient, and use simple language. Do not insist on eye contact. Allow time for responses. Use non-threatening gestures. Use signed board slash PX cards if available. If possible, avoid touching. If necessary, then explain why. Check for ID jewelry or ID card on clothing. Employ de-escalation techniques. All right. Now, the first situation where there was uh, no audio, it was a mental health call. Uh, here we have an officer typing, uh, and he's asking a question to clarify the elements of the law as applies to a particular situation. Blue, respond to possible jump. All right, now we've just scratched the surface of the number of potentially life-changing uh, applications of what we're doing. Now, we today want to ask for your help. Uh, we are setting out to fundamentally improve policing in this country, and we are starting right here in Cambridge. Thank you all. All right, we'd love to open it up for questions. Yes. Identify yourself. Ruben Sundani, and you mentioned that you're working with the Cambridge Police Department. Are you already piloting it, and what are the results? Yep. So as of two weeks ago, we met with the chief of the Cambridge Police and the chiefs of two other departments. Um, and they've agreed to give us full access to their command staff. Since then, we've been doing interviews of them to understand the right way to do this, the parameters to set on it, the pre-written, the things that need to be pre-written, um, and just how to handle this whole process. So we haven't, we haven't piloted it with them yet, but they've agreed that they want to try it out. They want to demo it. They want to try it out. Um, and then they're interested in it in the long term. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Thank you all for your time. All right. We're down to our last two companies. We got uh, Skill Ignite is our closer, our Bruce Springsteen, and then our David Bowie. I don't know. Maria, come on down. Um, so who likes this jacket? Who thinks this is good swag? Who thinks they're going to be sold on eBay? Yeah. I just want you to know we didn't tell the students we were going to give these at the beginning of the class, so this was not the incentive to get into the class. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Maria. Imagine a world. Oh, thank you. Could I have the clicker? Thank you. Oh, you're on the blue slide. Imagine a world where a woman can transform stress into strength. This is the bold vision we're bringing to life at WellSpace by building a tool that integrates self-care into their busy lives. My name is Maria Ko. I'm a second time tech entrepreneur, health and wellness practitioner, and a soon to be Harvard graduate with a master's degree in learning design innovation and technology. I've learned the hard way that stress is more than a feeling, that it is a physiological response that affects your immune system when I was diagnosed with an autoimmune condition. But I am not alone. 62% of young women in the US are completely overwhelmed by stress, and over 70% see their physical and mental health impacted. Extensive studies done on stress by top medical uh, schools in the country agree that establishing a consistent health-centered routine can 
significantly reduce stress. But here's the thing, building a routine that works for you consistently isn't easy. And that is why we've built a calendar plugin that works like your personal health assistant. It schedules activities beneficial for that user's mental and physical health, helping them make health easier, but not compromising their productivity. It is a lightweight solution that taps into the woman's current and ever-changing schedule and integrates down the line their data from wearables as well as their existing wellness memberships. We've also built an exciting social feature in which you can invite your friends and family for that activity hassle-free. What sets us apart from competitors is the specific focus on women's needs, as well as building a system that is real-time and proactive versus reactive. Behind Wellspace is a highly skilled team from Harvard and MIT building a solution that can help stress into joy. It turns stress into joy with years of experience in machine learning, design, and health and wellness. So far, we received a 4K, a 4K grant from the Harvard uh, Chan School of Public Health. And with that, we validated our concept, surveyed dozens of women, and built, our, built out our beta prototype, which is live now. With a 100K investment, we can make this platform available in October, starting our sales at $10 a month, We've targeted a group of 80 million women in the US, which gives us a total addressable market of $9.6 billion. Our call to action are the three Cs, collaboration, creativity, community. Can you connect us to marquee clients in your network? Are you interested in being part of our board of advisors? Do you wanna see Wellspace part of your company? Scan this QR code and book a Calendly uh, event with me and help us join, uh, jo join us in our mission in making health a priority, not a compromise. Thank you. You're gonna need this back. So this to me is a business plan that would have been pretty cool before AI and is amazingly cool post AI. Can you talk a little bit about what's empowered with AI that makes it different from what it would have been five years ago? Absolutely. Um, the amazing aspect that really excites me is that through using AI, we can learn what recommendations are exactly beneficial for the user. As the user accepts and rejects our calendar um, invites, we can see what is the most beneficial routine that works for them to create a plan that is effective and continues to add value into their daily life. The AI can also truly benefit the uh, user by integrating their personal uh, data from wearables, uh, as well as their self-inputted data, um, which can really give something that is of value to them and not generic information that they could Google online. Why specifically women users and uh, when will you include men or do you plan to at all? Absolutely, thank you for asking that question. Uh, women are disproportionately affected by stress um, not only in the quantity, in the numbers, but also in the way that chronic stress uh, uh, impacts their infertility, impacts uh, their um, uh, menstrual cycle, uh, as well as uh, the onset and development of autoimmune conditions, which has been heavily linked to chronic stress. And uh, this is no surprise that 80% of autoimmune condition uh, patients are women. One, two, three. Nice. Okay, so um, Becca, our co-founder from last cohort, is going to introduce our last group. I also want to recognize these guys produced the MIT graduation, but I think they have the most fun today. Uh, great job producing, and to everyone online. 
Um, and, you know, in some of these, it's like you don't hear who wins for like six months. In like 30 minutes, you're going to hear, uh, we're going to tabulate the judges' scores. So who's excited to hear? Okay. All right. Who's not excited and they're worried? All right, ladies and gentlemen, Becca, introduce your last group. Yes, we've had some incredible teams today and some incredible judges. And so I'm happy to introduce our last team, Skill Ignite, who are revolutionizing the workplace. Welcome. <laughs> Skill Ignite is here to unlock the power of your internal content. Who here has taken an e-learning course? Who here has had a bad experience with one? You're not alone, and the problem is only going to get worse. The World Economic Forum estimates that over 1 billion jobs will require upskilling in the next 10 years. And current solutions are too expensive, too slow, and don't take advantage of existing internal knowledge to meet this need. Large language models have only recently unlocked the solution. Today, companies spend millions on teams manually creating and recreating content. We believe with generative AI, we will be able to do this at less than one-tenth the cost. Skill Ignite is here to harness the power of AI to revolutionize the delivery of enterprise-specific knowledge, offering a cost-effective upscaling solution that seamlessly updates and adapts to changing needs. Skill Ignite can be used to help organizations like SAP. Take Lisa, for example. She's an L&D lead who is responsible for helping employees like Michael upskill. Michael is a cloud engineer who wants to grow into a role in DevOps. Uh, from Lisa's point of view, she can use Skill Ignite to import internal content, L&D databases, and external resources for best practices. She can format the requirements, she can filter the delivery method, and she can tag course content for seamless delivery. Our LLMs will synthesize this upscaling content when she clicks create. And Michael will see a personalized view of this content, which already takes into account the content that he knows as a cloud engineer, and will provide deep dives into, uh, into information that he must learn in order to grow into this new role. There's also the ability to chat with, the, with Skill Ignite in order to ensure that the content is ever evolving. Today, enterprises are pledging millions of dollars to upskill their employees to meet the changing demands in this new AI world. Uh, in 2028, it's expected that this market will grow to $420 billion. Upskilling is vital to business growth, to employee retention, and to individualized adaptation. Existing players are currently not able to use uh, internal content with generative AI. Uh, several companies in this space are currently valued over a billion dollars, and their content is static while ours is dynamic. Our near-term focus is on partnering with learning and development teams to gain access to data and secure enterprise buy-in. This will pave the way for us to expand past L&D teams into providing personalized upskilling solutions for individuals, provide live metrics on team skill gaps, and ultimately extend into customer education. We have 10 plus years of data science experience, success in founding and growing a company from three to 65 employees, and expertise in launching AI in highly regulated environments. Additionally, we have the support of renowned L&D leaders such as Nicole Helmer from SAP. We are asking for 500K to prototype and pilot the solution. We are also looking for partners in this area, and we are happy to connect with anyone through either the QR code or email, and we look forward to talking to you in a bit. Thank you for your time. It was perfect, no questions. <laughs> Always have a question. Uh, so uh, talk about the global globalization. So you know, prior to ChatGPT, AI, BARD, uh, things were always in a language. Now suddenly you can take all of this learning content, put it in any language, in any format, instantaneously for no cost. That's got to make you a global company instantaneously, right? 
Possibly is the answer. Um, we do want to make sure that we control this and really have that, you know, personal touch with L&D teams. So one of the things we are considering, we have talked to leaders such as Affirm, Pepsi, and SAP, and they all have this main problem. The thing that we want to do is they are currently consolidating a lot of their material, and we want to get in on this wave, especially when we are able to help them consolidate this faster. So the answer is yes, we would love to go global. But to begin with, we really want to make sure we understand the process from a U.S. perspective because a lot of that movement is happening now. Um, we saw this at South by Southwest and also the recent GSV ASU conference. Apparently, all everyone could talk about was AI applications specifically in upskilling and learning. So we want, we want to start within the U.S. because there is a wave happening here right now. Great. One, la uh, one last question. Is it Beth? Uh, here you go. Hi. That was great. Um, I'm just curious about um, trying to tap people's knowledge, which is in their heads and trapped, not the actual artifacts. The artifacts may not be as valuable as what's inside of people's brains. And that's really one of the big problems I'd like to see solved. Is that something you're thinking about? So yes. Um this was a presentation in terms of the beginning piece. When it comes to the follow on, one of the things that we have been exploring is the use of tokens to synthesize this information from SMEs or additional people in the organization. So we're looking at identifying informal leaders, being able to point out where skill gaps are, and figuring out that whole team component. The reason we want to start with L&D professionals is once we have their buy-in, we're able to expand much faster. We've seen a lot of solutions in the space start from the other side and then lack adoption on the end user perspective for employees because they don't find it helpful. If we start with L&D, and then synthesize that information, we believe that we can have the argument of why should employees provide this to us? The answer is it's going somewhere, it's going to be used, and it's going to immediately impact the company, as opposed to synthesizing it first and then having this long tail of content creation. One, two, three. Shawnee, come here. Yeah, great. So I, I also want to just show off. So 